Okay, when we bring the jury in, if the state will rest on the record, and I'll give the closing argument instruction, and then you may proceed. We will take a recess an hour into your argument. <coughs> are we ready to bring the jury in? Are, Defense ready? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and bring him in. Please be seated. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Welcome back. And as you're getting settled in with your notes, I'm going to ask you my questions. If your yes, answer is yes to any of my questions, please raise your hand. During the overnight recess, did any of you have any discussions amongst yourselves or with anybody else about the case? Yeah. No hands are being raised. Did any of you read or listen to any emails, text messages, Twitters? tweets, social networking pages, or blogs about the case? No. no hands are being raised. Did any of you use any type of an in, um, device to get on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology? No, no hands are being raised. And finally, did um, any of you read or create, or I already asked you that one. Never mind, it's been a long morning. <laughs> Okay, um, Mr. De La Le Rionda, the state rests? Yes, Your Honor, <clears throat> at this time we're announced to rest. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, both the state and the defendant have rested their cases. The attorneys will now present their final arguments. Please remember that what the attorneys say is not evidence or your instruction on the law. However, do listen closely to their arguments. They are intended to aid you in understanding the case. Each side will have equal time, but the state is, in is entitled to divide this time between an opening argument and a rebuttal argument after the defense has spoken. And just so we know, Mr. De La, De La Rianda will let us know when would be a good breaking time for a, a recess during his argument. So we will take a brief recess um, in the middle. You'll just let us know when. You may proceed. May it please the court, counsel. Good afternoon. A teenager is dead. He is dead through no fault of his own. 
He is dead because another man made assumptions. That man assumed certain things. He is dead not just because the man made those assumptions, because he acted upon those assumptions. And unfortunately, unfortunately, because his assumptions were wrong, Trayvon Benjamin Martin no longer walks on this earth. The defendant in this case, George Zimmerman, acted upon those assumptions. And because of that, a young man, a 17-year-old man, a barely 17-year-old man, I think he was three weeks past his birthday, is dead. Unfortunately, This is one of the last photos that will ever be taken of Trayvon Martin. And that is true because of the actions of one individual, the man before you, the defendant, George Zimmerman. A man who, after shooting Trayvon Martin, claims to not have realized that he was dead. And what did he do? Do you recall what the testimony was about what he did after? Did he render or attempt to render the same aid that those heroic officers from the Sanford Police Department did? who didn't wear the mask that they normally would wear, but gave mouth to mouth, performed CPR in an attempt to bring life back into that young boy? Did he do that? Recall also what happened when Mr. Manalo came out. And recall also what happened when the officer came out and that they handcuffed him. And recall what he told Mr. Manalo, please call my wife, and that apparently Mr. Manalo was taking too long or something. And he said, just tell her I killed him. Just kind of matter of fact. Those acts, those actions, speak volumes of what occurred that evening, Sunday evening, and they speak volumes of this defendant's actions. Sunday, February 27th, sorry, February 26, 2012, at 7.09 p.m. at the retreat of Twin Lakes townhomes. Now, you're obviously aware that the shooting actually happened minutes later. In fact, I think because of the recording that was made, we were actually able to precisely determine when that fatal shot occurred. And it occurred at 7, 16, and 55 seconds. But I would submit that the events leading up to this murder actually occurred not just earlier that Sunday evening, but months before. And why do I say that? Even though Trayvon Martin wasn't there months before, why do I say that the events leading up to this occurred months before? You recall the testimony of several people, but most importantly, the evidence you heard from this defendant's mouth when he was being interviewed by Investigator Singleton. 
when she first said something to the effect of, well, tell me what happened out there. I wasn't out there. I haven't gone to the scene. And what did he first say? Nine five zero. It's, it's, this is the correct one? Okay. So you live at one nine five zero retrieve view circle. Okay. I'm just gonna keep quiet and you would you tell me the story. You tell me what happened tonight. Okay? Okay. Just tonight. Yeah, what, or whatever led up to this. Anything you want to tell me about what happened and why it ended up, what it ended up to, to um, where this, this, this boy got shot. This, okay. The neighborhood has had a lot of crimes. Um, my wife saw our neighbors get broken into and she got scared. Are you talking about the residents or vehicles? The residents. Okay. While it was occupied. Um, so I decided to start a neighborhood watch program in my neighborhood. Okay, um, what is the name of the neighborhood? Retreat of Twin Lakes. Now, those actions weren't anything sinister or terrible or evil or of ill will. Those were actions that occur throughout the United States in many cities, unfortunately where crimes occur in a neighborhood and people get together and form neighborhood watches or other associations to deal with it. There's nothing sinister or wrong with that. But in this particular case, it led to the death of an innocent 17-year-old boy because this defendant made the wrong assumption. He profiled him as a criminal. He assumed certain things, that Trayvon Martin was up to no good. And that is what led to his death. Trayvon Martin, he was staying, he was there legally. He hadn't broken in or sneaked in or trespassed. He was there legally. He went to the 7-Eleven store earlier that evening. He bought what? What did he buy? What was his crime? He bought Skittles and some kind of watermelon or iced tea or whatever it's called. That was his crime. He had $40 and 15 cents in his pockets. He was wearing a photo button and he was speaking to a girl in Miami. He was minding his own business. But apparently, this defendant decided that he was up to no good, that the victim was up to no good. What had Trayvon Martin planned for that evening? To watch a basketball game with his younger, I guess you'd call him stepbrother or friend, the son of his father's fiance. That's where he was headed back home. You know, this wasn't at two o'clock in the morning or partying somewhere, not that that would in any way minimize it, but he wasn't, he was just doing a normal everyday thing. He went to the store, got something, got some Skittles and some tea or drink, and was just walking back. Now it was raining. He was wearing a hoodie. Last I heard, that's not against the law. But in this man's eyes, he was up to no good. He presumed something that was not true. Now, what's ironic about this, neighborhood watch, and you heard from Ms. Dorville, and you heard from officers, et cetera. Again, that's a respected thing that we encourage citizens to do. 
But in this particular case, he didn't even bother to find out if he thought he was up to no good. He called the, he called the police, the non-emergency number, but then he followed him, he tracked him. Because in his mind, in the defendant's mind, this was a criminal. And he was tired of criminals committing crimes out there. Again, that's not a bad thing. It's good that citizens get involved. But he went over the line. He assumed things that weren't true. And instead of waiting for the police, instead of waiting for the police to come and do their job, he did not. Because he, the defendant, wanted to make sure that Trayvon Martin didn't get out of the neighborhood. You might recall the prior testimony about the prior incidents. What happened? They would commit some kind of crime, apparently, and they would all flee by the time. I think there was one guy that was caught. But the rest of them would flee. And this defendant was sick and tired of it. So that night, he decided he, wanted, he, he was going to be what he wanted to be, a police officer. Now, police officers are trained. Recall one of the questions that was asked of Investigator Serino by the defense. Sir, if you were driving by and somebody was in the front yard and maybe looking through a window, would you, wouldn't you stop at your car and kind of investigate that? He, his first, on my re recollection, is that his comment was, his answer was, I would think maybe he lives there. But see, in this defendant's mind, because of the prior crime out there, he automatically assumed that Trayvon Martin was a criminal. And that's why we're here. That is why we're here. Because the defense is going to argue to you that this was self-defense. And they're going to say, what actually happened at the time of the shooting? And I'm going to talk about that, obviously. But you can't just take that in a vacuum. It's not like this defendant was just walking home and some guy came out of nowhere and just started beating him up. I mean, when you think of it, when you really honestly think about it, who was more scared? The guy, the kid, that was minding his own business and going home, that was being followed by another guy in a, in a truck, in an SUV, and that kept following him. Recall what he told Rachel Gentile? This guy was following him, and she said something to the effect of, well, maybe he's like a sex pervert or something. And that's when he referred to, he's a cracker, whatever words he used, and he used the N-word too. But when you think of it, that is the person that was scared, I would submit. Now, Trayvon Martin, unfortunately, can't come into this courtroom and tell you how he was feeling. And that's true because of the actions of one man, the defendant. Let's talk about the defendant that night. No dispute that he lived there at Retreat of Twin Lakes. No dispute that he was part. I would submit he was, he was the neighborhood watch. But again, that's perfectly good. That's a good thing. But he was upset that burglars got away. That's also a good thing. That's good that people get involved. And apparently, according to his statement, he was driving the target. Now, he's driving to Target, it's raining, and what does he do? Okay, he calls the police some suspicious, but then he tracks this guy down. He tracks Trayvon Martin. He doesn't just call the police and, okay, stay in your car. He keeps following him. And then he goes even further, he gets out of the car. So he sees the victim, he's suspicious of the victim, and then he calls 911, not emergency. Now, all those actions, no crime's been committed there. There's no crime right there. But it's important to realize this is what led to Trayvon Martin being dead. The defendant, 28 years old, 5 foot 7, 204 pounds, and armed. Now let me stop right here. He had the right to bear arms. We live in this great country, and the Second Amendment allows people to carry a firearm. And he had a permit. He had a right to have a concealed permit, to have a concealed firearm. So again, he is not violating any law. The victim in this case, 
17 years old, 5 foot 11, 158 pounds. And he was unarmed. Well, I guess if you would consider Skittles or the tea a weapon, I'm not trying to make light of it, but the defense is saying, oh, it's that concrete, you know, like, and we'll talk about the concrete. But what started this? Assumptions, incorrect assumptions on the part of one individual. And again, that's the last photograph we have of Trayvon Martin. This innocent 17-year-old kid was profiled as a criminal. To quote the defendant, and part of my language, he was one of those assholes that get away. Part of my language. He was one of those fucking punks. Now, the defendant, Mr. Zimmer, didn't scream that out. And so the defense will argue, well, that shows that he didn't have any ill will or hatred. No, I would submit to you that he uttered it under his breath. And that itself indicates ill will and hatred. Because he was speaking to the 911 or non-emergency person. But what he was doing is he was verbalizing what he was thinking. And that's why that's important. Because in his mind, he already assumed certain things that Trayvon Martin was a fucking punk and he was an asshole and he wasn't going to get away this time. You recall the prior calls? We brought in five, I think defense put in another one, six within the last five, six months where crimes have been committed in the neighborhood. He was sick and tired of it. But the law doesn't say, okay, you know, take the law into your own hands. Oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong guy. Oh, I I'm so sorry, I thought he was a criminal. Mr. Martin, Tracy Martin, Sabrina Fulton, I am so sorry, I made a mistake. I didn't realize that Trayvon Martin was up to, was, was minding his own business. I am terribly sorry. You know, the law doesn't say that. The law talks about accountability and responsibility for one's actions. And that's what we're asking for in this case. Hold the defendant responsible for his actions. Hold him accountable for what he did. Because if the defendant hadn't assumed that, Trayvon Martin would have watched the basketball game. George Zimmerman, I'm assuming, would have gone to Target and did whatever he does on Sunday evenings, and we wouldn't be here. Law doesn't allow people to take the law into their own hands. It doesn't allow, quite frankly, even the police to take the law into their own hands. The police had gotten called out there. They would have done. They, they would have, okay, are you, what are you doing here? Can I ask you what you're doing? Do you mind telling me? And under the law, they're allowed to ask somebody who's walking the streets. The person can ignore them or not. That's not a crime. Most people say, listen, I, I live right, I'm right here. I'm going home. You know, you want to come? But this defendant didn't give Trayvon Martin a chance. Recall the testimony of this defendant in terms of the interviews, and I'm gonna play certain parts for you, but recall how he says that at one point that Trayvon Martin is circling his car? And my point in saying that is, number one, you've gotta determine whether that's true. But let's presume that part is true. And he says he's got something in his hands. Why does this defendant get out of the car if he thinks that Trayvon Martin is a threat to him. Why? Why? Because he's got a gun. He's got the equalizer. He's going to take care of it. He's a wannabe cop. He's going to take care of it. He's got a gun. And my God, it's his community. And he's not going to put up with it. And if the police are taking too long to respond, he's going to handle it. Now, did he go over there and say, I'm going to kill this kid? No. This isn't first degree murder, it's not premeditated. But his actions resulted in the death 
of a 17-year-old boy. Did they not? I mean, do you have an innocent man before you? Is it really self-defense when you follow somebody? First of all, when you profile somebody incorrectly, when you automatically label him a criminal because he's acting in your mind, and in his mind, excuse me, as suspicious, because he's wearing a hoodie, because it's raining and he's walking the streets or not walking fast enough. I thought in this great country, no matter how stupid we might think somebody's acting because it's raining and he's walking or doing whatever, that that's not against the law. He did have his hoodie on. It was raining off and on. What's ironic in this case, and what I want to spend some time talking with you about, is the defendant's statements. Because you might think, well, hold on. You're the state. What are you putting on his self-serving statements when he's denying committing a crime, when he's saying it's self-defense? We wanted to tell you all the evidence. We wanted to put in all the witnesses that saw something of value out there. Because we wanted you to get the truth. We wanted you to get the complete story. But in doing so, I want to analyze, dissect with you the defendant's statements. Why was it necessary for the defendant to exaggerate everything that happened? Why was it that it took him a while, even at the very end, he kept denying something? What? Obviously, he kept denying that he intentionally killed him, that it was, you know, he said self defense. But what was important even before that? What did he keep denying? That he followed him. Because the defendant knew that if he admitted he followed him, then that showed that ill will hatred. That put him in that category, you got part of my language, a fucking punk, an asshole. And that's what we have here, ladies and gentlemen. That's why he kept talking about, oh, I didn't know the name of the street. I, I was looking for an address. Remember that video, and I'm going to show it to you again, that part where he's walking and he goes to the, to the detectives, like, like the investigators, like there's some fools or something. Look, this is the back of the houses here. There's no addresses. Well, right in front of him is an, is an address. And by the way, there's only three streets. How difficult can it be? And he's the neighborhood watch guy. He's been living there four years, and he takes his dog down to that dog walk. But he doesn't know the names of the street. He doesn't know the main street that you go in. Because see, when he admits something like that, then it proves one thing, that he was following him. That he had profiled him and he was following him. And that shows his guilt. Because it shows that his actions led, unfortunately, to the death of Trayvon Martin. So you can't just say, okay, what happened at the actual interaction between them? And again, we're gonna talk about that because Unfortunately, and I stress unfortunately, there's only one person, well, there's two people, one person's not with us anymore, but there's only two really people who knew what really happened out there. And he, the defendant, made sure that other person couldn't come to this courtroom and tell you what happened. He, the defendant, silenced Trayvon Martin. But I would submit to you, even in silence, his body provides evidence as to this defendant's guilt. And why do I say that? Because from DNA, from lack of blood, other stuff, his body speaks to you. And even in death, that, and it proves to you that this defendant is lying about what happened. Do you recall one of the things we talked about at some point with one of the witnesses, I think it was Dr. DeMaio, you know, a very impressive, distinguished doctor about this photograph the defendant, defense keeps parading. Recall what I did? I said, what do you expect? Blood. And I'm going to show you the photographs. Not just at the medical examiners because they're saying, oh, that Dr. Bao, he's incompetent, he didn't know what he was doing. No, I'm going to show you the photographs at the scene, which show what? No blood in his hands. Now they're gonna say, oh, it was raining that night. Wow, and I guess the blood on the defendant's head just stuck there, right? 
but on the victim, they just kind of vanished. Can't have it both, can't have it like that. See, because what's important is the defendant in an attempt to convince the police that he was really shooting this man, this boy in self-defense, he had to exaggerate what happened. That's why he had to at some point say, oh, he was threatening me. It was almost like the levels of fear ex escalated. And we'll talk about that, how he was then, originally he hit him, and then he got him on the ground, and then there was a struggle, and then he got the upper hand, and then, um, let's see, it got worse, and then he threatened to kill him, and then he put his hand over his mouth, suffocating him, and then he pinched his nose, and then he went for the gun. See how he's, he's exaggerating everything? Oh, you don't believe this stuff? Well, hold on, it was even more dangerous. Because you know why? This defendant, as you heard, has studied the law in terms of what's required for self-defense. And he's got all those bullet points in terms of what's required. So if you take one word out of here that I would submit to you shows this defendant's guilt, it's assumptions on the part of the defendant. The defendant assumed that the victim didn't belong at the retreat of Twin Lakes, didn't he? that the victim was committing or about to commit a burglary. He assumed and he profiled the victim as a criminal. He assumed that the victim was one of those uh, that always got away. He assumed also that he was an effing punk. And the victim was going to get away before the police arrived. Now, what didn't the defendant do? Let's assume he was assuming that. And again, assuming something is not against the law by itself. Unless you're wrong. Well, let's assume at that time he legitimately thought that Trayvon Martin might be committing a crime. Okay, he called the police. Not an emergency number. It's a good thing. But what did he do? He didn't, you know, when this victim is coming up to him and like, cir he claims circling his car, like, like, what are you doing, man? What are you following me for? He didn't say, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm with the neighborhood watch. Or do you, you know, can I assist you in some way? You look lost or you look like you don't know what's going on. Can I help you? Can I give you a ride? Or let's say he was scared of him, but he could have said, do you live around here? Can I call the police? Can I call a friend? He didn't do that. He didn't take any action because he already, in his mind, had assumed that he was a criminal. And he wasn't going to give him any benefit of the doubt. He rolled down the window and identified himself as a neighborhood watch. Just say, listen, I've called the police. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a pervert. I'm not following you for anything, whatever your name is. But you mind waiting? The police are on their way. They're going to be here in about 30 seconds or a minute. Sometimes they take a little bit longer. But would you mind waiting here? I'm a little suspicious of what you're doing. Would you mind waiting? He didn't do that. Did he wait for the police? No. Did he wait inside his car? No. Did he let the victim know he wasn't a weirdo? No. So let's talk about weighing the evidence in terms of what the instructions the court will give you an opportunity to see and know. Were the answers that the witness gave straightforward? Did anybody have an interest in the outcome? And did the evidence agree with the other evidence? Are there prior inconsistent statements? And again, use your God-given common sense. What do we have here? Really, what does it boil down to? You heard a little bit, and we put evidence of the fact that the defendant at one point wanted to be a police officer. I mean, I've been in law enforcement 30 years, prosecutor. There's nothing wrong. That's a good thing. We ought to encourage people to be police officers. That's an honorable profession. He applied in Virginia, didn't get in, and then he's doing other stuff. He's taking criminal justice credits. That's good. But again, it doesn't say that the law allows a person to take the matters into their own hand. If not, why are we here? I mean, let's, why do we have courtrooms? Why do we have jurors? Let's just let people handle it outside. Oh, they're wrong. Well, you know, sorry.
So I want to talk about the witnesses. And before I do that, I want to take a moment to um, thank you for your time and service. I think we started over four weeks ago in, in this process that we're all so fortunate to, to be able to, to live in, you know, live the Constitution in terms of asking people to come from their everyday lives and give up a lot at, from work and from family to serve as jurors. So I think I, I speak on behalf of everybody, the defense, the court, and everybody, we thank you for your time and your patience. This case is very important to the state of Florida. It's important to the victim's family, it's important to the defendant. And it's also important, obviously, to you. You probably realized that as you all are watching the juror, I'm sorry, the witnesses and watching the trial, periodically the attorneys will watch you and, and the court will. And you guys were very attentive. Some took more notes than others. But without a doubt, nobody was falling asleep. And you know, it's a long process. You've been here a long time and we're towards the end. But I want to take a few moments and talk about what I would submit is how you arrive at a verdict. You know, we ask in this great country for people to serve as jurors without really any legal experience. In a lot of countries, they don't have. They have lawyers or judges that are already automatically plugged in as such, and that's what they do. They have professional people that sit as jurors. We ask people to come from their everyday lives and sit as jurors. That's what I would submit makes this country great. So how is it that if you're asked to come and you really don't have any legal experience, how do you arrive at a verdict that speaks the truth? How do you arrive at a verdict that is just? I would submit to you do three things. Number one, you rely obviously on the witnesses, the testimony, the evidence that you'll have, the physical evidence that you saw, and you'll be able to digest more if you want to, the recordings, all that other stuff. Number two, you rely on the law that Judge Nelson will read to you and you'll actually be provided a copy of. And number three, and perhaps most importantly, you rely on your God-given common sense. You know, that common sense that we just kind of use automatically without even having to think about it to make decisions at home and at work, the law encourages you to do that in evaluating the evidence, determining what's valid, what's not, and what makes sense. And when you do those three things, when you rely on the witness's testimony, the physical evidence, and other stuff, when you rely on the law, and then when you rely and apply your common sense to you, I would submit to you, you come back with a verdict that speaks the truth, a verdict that is just, and that verdict would be that this defendant is guilty of murder in the second degree. I mean, do you believe that there is an innocent man sitting over there right now? Do you believe that he just assumed something, but he kind of overreacted a little bit, but you know, it really wasn't his fault that Trayvon Martin is dead. Do you believe that this was just kind of a struggle or an argument or a discussion or a fight that just kind of got out of hand? Perhaps, but who started this? Who followed who? Who was minding their own business? And again, of the two, who was the one that was armed? And who knew that they were armed? I hope you can see that from there. We, uh, and I've got it right here too. Um, it's a timeline, and it's going to kind of tell you a little bit about what happened there. It's a timeline showing the phone call, and you'll be able to take it back there. It's in evidence. But it's a timeline showing the phone call between Rachel Gentel and Trayvon Martin. There's two parts to it, and it's color-coded. Hopefully, we've made it fancy so you all can, can uh, decipher it. You know, I'm old, and I'm getting used to now the computer systems, but hopefully it makes sense. And what you also have is you also have George Zimmerman's call, so you have exact time in terms of the length of the call. 
Then you also have it broke up originally with, as you recall, Ms. Gentel talked that she lost contact and then she got it back up. And then you have Ms. Lauer's call. And that's why I was able to tell you unequivocally as to when the gunshot occurred. Because we were able to time when Ms. Lauer made the call and you hear the gunshot, unfortunately, in that call. And then you have other calls to Ms. Sardaika that you heard speak. And then you have when Officer Smith arrived at the, at the retreat of Twin Lakes and you have Mr. Good's call. So I would submit to you that's relevant in terms of establishing the timeline as best we can as to what occurred. Now, are people off, you know, by a few minutes possibly, but the phone records don't, don't lie. Because my recollection was that we spent, I think, half a day one day and possibly half a day the next day hearing from one witness. Her name was Rachel Gentel. Now, this young lady, I would submit to you, is not a very sophisticated person. She's not the most educated, but she's a human being, and she spoke as best she could. You know, she happens to be, what, Haitian or of Haitian descent, and, you know, made a big deal about, oh, you can't read cursive. Yes, yeah, she can, unfortunately. She's, what, 18, 19? <coughs> but did what she tell you as best she could, and maybe her English wasn't the best, maybe her speech, her language was a little colorful. I think she referred to me as that bald-headed dude and referred to other phrases to describe other people. But did she speak the truth? Because when you think of it, she was the person that was speaking to the victim. And really, the conversation that she had with the victim, nobody would know whether she's telling the truth or not other than her. I mean, we have the phone records that established it, that there's no dispute that they were talking. But what I'm saying is, she didn't have to, she could have embellished, she could have lied about what the victim said and when she referred to the guy that was following him, that creepy guy, when she said to him, he's probably a pervert or a sexual or something, why is this guy following you? And Trey Vaughn Martin said he's, what, a white ass, whatever, cracker, or whatever. She didn't color it. Yeah, when she talked to the victim's mother, she didn't use that language. But she didn't come in here and lie to you about that. I mean, she could have, and nobody would have known the difference. It wasn't like her conversation was being recorded. But see, her use of colorful language doesn't mean that her testimony is less credible just because she's not a highly educated individual. Again, we have records that establish that that conversation took place. So there's no dispute about that. And those records are up there. But let's talk about, she spent hours on that witness stand, why? I guess attempt to discredit her in some way? You decide whether she was telling the truth. Do you disregard what she said because her family's from Haiti? Because she isn't sophisticated? And she, because she can't read cursive, unfortunately? I mean, is that what you, should, what you should do? I don't think the instructions are gonna tell you that, but you could decide. Well, she's not very educated, I don't think she's. And I'm not saying that you will. But I mean, why do we take so long in asking her questions? because we're trying to get to the truth, both sides. But I think the other witnesses, I guess, were maybe more sophisticated, they didn't, it didn't take six hours or whatever. Anyway, you decide. But did what she say comport or match up with the evidence that the other people were talking? I would submit it, it did. I mean, think back, and it happened a while ago, but think about what she said. What she said, Trayvon Martin said, and isn't it consistent with the evidence? I mean, is there any dispute that this defendant profiled, it's my word, you can use whatever your word you want to use, but isn't it true that this defendant assumed that Trayvon Martin was a criminal? I mean, he even tells the police that. Why is, isn't that consistent with what Rachel Gentile tells you? Didn't even the defendant in his statements to the police say, yeah, 
the kid or however he referred to him, the guy, whatever, he's running away. Didn't she say that? I had a dream that today a witness would be judged not on the color of her personality, but of the content of her testimony. On the content of her testimony. Just because she's got a colorful personality, just because she referred to me as a bald-headed dude or whatever, that doesn't mean her story, her statements aren't accurate. Was the evidence consistent with what she said? <coughs> Wasn't she on the telephone with the victim? Isn't it true the defendant was following the victim? Didn't the victim attempt to get away? Didn't the defendant confront the victim? I don't think the defense will admit that. The defendant and the police didn't admit that. But what did he say? Oh, I was just looking for an address. Oh, I was just looking for the street. Oh. You were minding your own business, and all of a sudden, this victim that you were following just decided to all of a sudden attack you out of nowhere. In fact, she went a little further, I will submit. She warned the victim that maybe he was a sexual pervert. And again, colorful words were used by her to describe the defendant in terms of what the victim had described the defendant as. I would submit to you that that's an example that she's telling the truth. Now, she did lie about funeral and about her age originally to the police, to me, to the mother. Why? Okay, she's guilty of that. She didn't want to go have to see the body. She didn't want to deal with it. And she lied to the mother of Trayvon Martin. So. You could disregard her testimony because of that. She lied about her age because she didn't want to come forward. <coughs> Maybe she realized that she might have to testify and people would find out that she can't read cursive. Unfortunately. We have the defendant's non-emergency call. No dispute about that, that's recorded. I believe there might be a dispute as to whether the operator told him not to follow or not. You decide. What was in that recording? Okay. These assholes, they always get away. Why was it necessary to say that under his breath. Doesn't that kind of show, demonstrate what the defendant was feeling at the time? I mean, that wasn't information that he was providing to the operator, like, okay, he is a, pardon my language, an asshole, so when the officer comes, he can go, pardon my language, asshole, asshole, where are you? That wasn't a description so that the officer could identify him. Was it? Why is he uttering that, that word? Other than that's how he feels. Now, defense may get up here and tell you, oh, he was just angry. Well, you decide. I would submit to you on behalf of the state of Florida, that's more than a little angry. That's frustration. That's kind of ill will, hatred, that you've made up your mind he's a criminal, and you're tired of these criminals committing crimes, and my God, he's not going to get away. Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. Okay. All right, sir, what is your name? Why was it necessary to, again, utter the words effing punk? If he hadn't already in his mind determined that he was a criminal, that Trayvon Martin was a criminal and he was not going to get away. Recall the testimony in terms of the entrance 
And again, we talked about the fact that there's only three streets. This is one. This is the one that circles all the way around, and then there's another one. But of course, he claims to not know the street that he comes in and every day, in and out, Twin Tree Lane, right here. He claims to not know that street. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna show you. In that interview, with one of the interviews with the, with the detective, in the car, leading up to it, he makes reference to the street name. And then, like, a minute later, he's talking about, I don't know the name of the street. He inadvertently let out that he was aware of that street because he let out that that was a lie that he told the police so that it would justify why he is following, why he is profiling, why he is tracking a young man. And again, that's just a close-up of where this happened right here. You're obviously very well familiar with it, and we've got some more exhibits for that. We have Ms. Lauer's call, the 911 call. And really, Ms. Lauer, what did she say? She didn't see anything. She stayed inside. I think at some point in that phone call, she's telling her husband to be, I think they, they're married now, um, Jeremy Weinberg. Um, Jeremy, get, you know, get away from the window and do something. Don't go out there. But the bottom line is she recorded it. But what did she say? Before the actual recording, before she called the police, she heard something going on out there. Because, see, this wasn't like the defendant claims that out of the blue, the victim just kind of attacked him and knocked him to the ground and they just started beating him. No, this started, I would submit, further down, but it didn't start right at the T where the defendant claims it occurred. Ms. Dyka. You heard from her too. And we've got the vantage point in terms of there, where her, her place was. My recollection was she's got um, a cat, I think his name was Leo, who's got a ledge there. And she was kind of looking out and she was reading at some point. She got up, she looked. She had a good vantage point. She did observe something. And what did she tell you? That in her opinion, based on what she saw, she thought the bigger man was on top. And she told you that the voice she heard, she thought was of a child versus a, an older person. Now, is she an expert? Had she ever heard these voices before? No. She's just telling you what she believes. Just like you've had a bunch of other people come in and say, oh, that is George Zimmerman's voice, and that is Trayvon Martin's voice. You decide. But she told you as best she could what she observed. And what's consistent in terms of what she observed and what happened? Because, see, the issue is at that time when there was contact between the defendant and the victim, did it occur as the defendant claims? First of all, you'd have to believe that he really wasn't following him, and he was just kind of minding his own business. He was going out for a walk. His walk got interrupted because some guy attacked him. You've got to believe that. You gotta believe he wasn't following anybody. He wasn't up to doing anything. He was just kind of minding his own business. And as he was walking back, the victim, for some reason, just decided to go attack him. So you gotta have that assumption. It's gotta be accurate. And then you've gotta assume that then the victim just hit him and knocked him to the ground and just started beating him. And, and poor defendant, poor George Zimmerman, he just kind of took it, boom, boom, just getting whacked over and over. He never did anything. Compare the sizes. And then, oh, at the last moment, he was able to take out that gun, his concealed gun, and was able just to just shoot him. You have the testimony of John Good, who did call 911. And the time frame is important in terms of when his call was made. I think in, in, in opening statements, the defense told you that, represented to you that he is the eyewitness. He is the crucial eyewitness. He's the only eyewitness. I beg to differ, but again, it's what's important is what you think. 
Let's talk a little bit about John Good. What did John Good tell you? He saw what he believed was the victim on top of the defendant. Now, he did not see the shooting. He saw prior to the shooting. I would submit to you when you kind of put all the witnesses together that there wasn't just like the defendant knocking the victim down to the ground and then just staying on top of him and beating the hell out of him. I would submit to you that there was contact between them, that there was a fight, there was a struggle. Ironically, of the two, one of the individuals is the one that's had, what, 18 months MMA fighting? Oh, but of course, he's just a pudgy, uh, overweight man, is I think what uh, Mr. Pollock said. He really didn't progress beyond the first level, but he's the one that's had MMA training of some type. But anyway, they interacted, they rolled around, and they fought. But again, you can't just take that in a vacuum. Why did this occur? What led up to this? And at the time of the shooting, was it necessary to shoot him? Well, the defense is going to parade the photographs of the injuries. I don't think I need to show you the one photo that counts, do I? The ME photo. Who suffered the most serious injury of all? You heard from Ms. Bonador. What did she tell you? Oh, I apologize. Mr. Good, he said that he saw a struggle out there. He saw the victim, who he believes was the victim, based on clothing description, he didn't know him, on top of the defendant. And he saw the victims doing something to the defendant. He originally said it was MMA style, but when asked specifically, did you actually see blows, he said no. I saw movement there. He may have been hitting him, but I don't know. What's also very important about what Mr. Good told you? He told you that he could not see the defendant's hands. So did the defendant have the gun out at that point? Was he trying to get it out? And was Trayvon Martin at that point, which is about, what, 25, 30 seconds or so before the shooting, was he trying to protect himself from that gun? Is that what the struggle was about? That at some point this defendant had the gun? defendant claims at the very end, right before, unfortunately, he had to shoot the victim, that the victim grabbed the gun. Unfortunately for him, the truth comes out, and it refutes what the defendant said. Recall the testimony of Mr. Rogone in terms of the DNA? There wasn't any on the gun. Recall what he told his best friend, Mr. Osterman, what the defendant told Mr. Osterman, not like a month later, that same evening, meaning the morning after, when he picked him up at the police station and drove him to his house, that he, the victim had grabbed the gun. Not the holster, grabbed the gun. <clears throat> Excuse me, in fact, Mr. Osman told you he wrote a book about it with his wife. Ms. Bahador told you that she heard something out there. I think it was either Ms. Bahador or Ms. Serdaka heard something like no, I think that kind of matches up with what uh, Rachel Gentile told you about, like, get off of me or something to that effect. Again, you all took great notes. I'm sure you paid attention to when the witnesses were out there. So I'm not going to cover every little minor point, but it's consistent with what Rachel Gentile told you. And she described, my recollection was that she described she lives right here at 2841. She described movement this way. Was the victim headed home, as Miss Gentile told you? And I need to show you the bigger diagram, because you know what's ironic? Is recall even the defendants from the defendant's own mouth that they always got away in this exit over here, the other exit, and the victim, you might recall, was staying right here. Was he headed there and did the defendant kind of 
cut them off. But it's consistent with what Miss Bahado told you in terms of from her back, left to right. And what did she see? She saw them struggling. That is defending the victim struggling upright. Defendant claims that Trayvon Martin is the strongest guy in the world because he grabbed him, picked him up, and then transported him, what, 20 yards, 30? You, you saw the pictures, and I'll talk about the diagram, but he claims that he pushed them, you know, or pulled them all the way over here. Recall where all the items are in connection to where the victim ended up? The Manalos. Mrs. and Mr. Manalo talk to you about what they observed, or what they really didn't observe. My recollection is Ms. Manalo said that the bigger person was on top. They made a big issue of the defense in cross-examining her. Hold on, but you did see some photographs on TV, and the photographs you saw were of Trayvon Martin and showed him playing football in a, you know, like a football uniform. Yeah, that's true. But I still think the person on top was the bigger person. Now, she didn't see the shooting. My point is that there was a fight there. There was a struggle, and at some points, it appears, based on the evidence, that the defendant was on top, and at some points, the victim was on top. It's wrestling, struggling, whatever you want to call it. But why did it occur? Why did it occur? If you believe he's an innocent man, then you believe that the victim just decided to come up and just smack him. Smacked the defendant, and the defendant fell to the ground, and the victim just started beating him up for, oh, we don't know, but for some reason. And that the defendant really wasn't following him. The defendant really was just kind of walking back to his car. The defendant was truthful when he was telling the police that he was just kind of trying to find out what the address was, or he was trying to find out what that street name was. And, and I apologize, Mr. Manalo told you that he went outside within seconds, I think it was like 20, 30 seconds, and when he stepped outside, he observed a defendant, and he said he thought the defendant was beaten up. He said the defendant was doing something, acting, and then he said he asked him about the phone and talking about calling his wife. And that's when he made that remark, just tell her I, I killed him or I shot him. And you might be thinking, well, hold on, if there was a fight, if there was a struggle, what, how does that factor in? Well, and who started it? Who was following who? Who was chasing who? Who had the right if they were being chased? Does the defendant have the right to self-defense? I'm sorry, does the victim? When he's being chased by this person? It's, it's, you'll, you'll hear the facts in this case, and you'll hear in terms of whether the defendant was chasing him or not. You know, it was dark out there. There's no dispute about that. It was raining. No dispute about that. And that's what these photographs show. It shows the distance from one, uh, the sidewalk or dog walk to where the body was. Shows where several items were. And you've got the diagrams and you've got the photographs. One thing I would submit that these photographs show is the absence of blood on that sidewalk. The other big thing is, if the defendant was really having his head bashed in as the, he claims to the police, and he has some injuries to the back of his head, and we'll talk about that, but I think there were, what, centimeters or less? Why isn't his jacket all torn up, or at least scratched up, if he was being picked up over and over why is his jacket all right, the back of his jacket? You think about that? Or is he exaggerating what happened? 
flashlight, that was with the key ring, and that was, uh, that's the one that was still on. Stage exhibit 10 showed another angle in terms of the evidence out there. In terms of there apparently was some slope, and we'll talk about the significance of that because based on what defendant told police. And again, this is showing stage exhibit 15, so the body was covered up. That's the other flashlight that the defendant had, and I think he told the police that it stopped working or something. If you want to, check again his statements to the police. Was he carrying it in one hand? Why was he carrying it in one hand? Okay, I guess he took it out there to see, tracked down Trayvon Martin, and then it just stopped working, so he didn't put it in his pocket. I guess he was carrying his hand. That's the victim's phone. There's no dispute that he was talking on the phone. And this is how, when they attempted to save his life, he was turned over. I show you this photograph, not to show you just that, but I show you that because I wanted you to focus on this. He was speaking on the phone. And he had ear plugs or whatever you call them. Stage exhibit 22 is a close-up of where the gunshot was, and also this photograph button. One thing I'd suggest to you that might be important to note on that is it was a big deal made about the jacket, or the hoodie, or the sweatshirt, how it, it had to be consistent with the can and how to do that. Well, that button might have something to do with the way that sweatshirt is kind of hanging. It's a little big on them, but also that might affect the angle of how much is sticking out of the sweatshirt. You decide. Stage exhibit 23, why is that important? Do you see any blood on his hands? On the victim's hands? Stage exhibit 24, do you see any blood on his hands? I mean, is there any dispute that the defendant's mouth, nose, I'm sorry, had some blood on it? How come there isn't any blood on the victim's hands? Because the argument was made or suggested to you in terms of the cross-examination of the medical examiner and all that, oh, you had to wash his hands, so that wasn't accurate. You know, you all didn't know what you were doing there. Well, right there at the scene, where was the blood? The other interesting thing is that I will submit to you, just based on the evidence, I don't know what you call this, I don't know if it's a drawstring or what, why is one of them a lot longer than the other one? Was the defendant maybe pulling on that as the victim was trying to back out? It's ironic that you see how one is pulled all the way down? And which side is it on? Stage exhibit 29 to show some of the other exhibits out there. Stage exhibit 33. I put this in here because I thought and we talked about it, I believe it came out during the testimony, that there's a street address right there. That's where the defendant claimed he didn't know A, the, the street name, or he couldn't find an address. Even though he's lived out there four years, he takes his dog out there, or dogs out there to walk, but he doesn't know that there's street addresses because this isn't just like some fancy or, or just regular neighborhood that all the houses are different. These are kind of cookie cutter, they're all the same. But he didn't know the that there was addresses out there, so that's why he had to walk that long distance to find the address or find the street for the police to aid him. Stage exhibit 36, those are just some daytime photographs kind of showing the area in terms of what happened out there. Stage exhibit 76, there's been a big issue about that photograph. It shows how he, the defendant was bleeding. I believe Mr. Manalo took that photograph. Why is the blood still on there, and why would the blood not be on the victim's hands? It's interesting, too, the direction of the blood. And we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what happened. Stage exhibit 77. This is, again, Mr. Manalo before the police got out there. Where are the victim's hands? but under his body? What did the defendant claim to you? 
He used police jargon in terms of suspect and, well, the police, of course, they always spread out the arms, the hands, to make sure there's no weapon there. Because he's trying to tell the police that what happens is he was scared, and he at one point said, oh, I thought I had, he had something in his hand, so I was checking for that weapon. That's what I was doing. Well, it's inconsistent with the physical evidence out there. Now, defense may argue, hold on, didn't Dr. DeMaio said that you could take out a person's heart and then they could live for 15 seconds and that the person could kind of walk or do all this other stuff? Okay, so you take out the heart and the defendant kind of moves him and spreads out his hands and so he's taking even more blood pumping out and he's able, and then the, the victim just kind of happens to just kind of lift himself up and put the hands underneath? I don't know. You decide. Why did he have to say that? Because it's part of him wanting to be a cop. And that's what police officers do. Even when they shoot somebody, they usually handcuff them. Even if the person is dead, I mean, they handcuff them just for security purposes. The other interesting thing is, that's, you recall the flashlight the defendant had in terms of his, in relation to where the body was. And again, the photograph that I showed you, State Exhibit 79, that was showing, I think, one of the few witnesses out there. And State Exhibit 80, those are the two photographs that were showing out there that was taken, I think, by Officer Wagner. Defendant's gun. You recall what we heard about that from an expert regarding DNA? Swap from the pistol grip matches the defendant. And Trayvon Mars excluded. That is inconsistent with what the defendant claimed to Mr. Osterman. He told the police he was going for the gun. He told Mr. Osterman that he had the gun or grabbed the, I think he described what part of the gun he grabbed. And then there's other test results, not limited, and then no determination made on the other side. In the holster. You had also, I would submit, relevant the fingernail scrapings of the victim in this case. What were the findings? No DNA foreign to Trayvon Martin, no DNA results at all. So the victim in this struggle that the defendant claims he had with him when he was trying to kill him, basically, or sh shut him up so that he couldn't speak, where did all the blood go? Where did all the defendant's blood go? While we're on that subject, the defendant claims that he was the only one yelling out there. So all the cries for help were only him. You gotta decide whether it was him or whether it was Trayvon Martin or whether it was both of them. It had to be one of them or both. But if he's yelling and if he's down and if he's got all his blood and he's swallowing the blood, how's he able to do all that? And why is there a consistent, in terms of yells of help, 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 why, why, why is it a muffled down? Why, why is he able to yell if the defendant claims that the victim was, how's he, how's he gonna talk? Or is he lying about that? I would submit to you that's another lie. You saw that the uh, hooded jacket was checked, and I'm just giving you very quickly the DNA results. You've got an exhibit there that's got them all in there. But just to demonstrate to you how thorough the investigation was in terms of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement doing their thorough analysis of the case in terms of the evidence. Wait a minute, we take it, I don't know how far we've gone. The, the the, if you're ready, to if you're ready to yes, take a break, we'll take a 15 minute recess. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your notepads face down on the chair and follow Deputy Jarvis back into the jury room. Please be seated. Court will be in recess for 15 minutes.
please be seated. We're back on the record. Is um, State and Defense ready to bring the jury back in? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's go ahead and bring them in. Please be seated. You may continue. Please support. I'm showing you a photograph of the left hand of Trayvon Martin. And obviously in addition to the gunshot wound, that was the only other injury that was observed when the autopsy was performed. As you can see from that photograph, there is a very minute or small injury right there and an even smaller one over here, the abrasion on his left hand. Recall also the testimony was that he was right-handed. So if, if the beating at, was as severe as I would submit Mr. Zerman um, claims, then how did it occur? I guess maybe we can speculate, but I think even Dr. DeMaio said, well, sometimes you hit something and you don't necessarily injure your hands. That's a possibility. Well, that could also be true for George Zierman's hands. The defendant, George Zierman, two people, one shot to death and one repeatedly lies about how it happened. Why, why might that be? You wonder? If one is shot to death and the other one lies, why would that person lie? He brought a gun to a struggle or to a fight that he started by following and wanting to make sure that the victim didn't get away. And now he wants to let you, you to let him off because he killed the only eyewitness. The victim, Trayvon Martin, who was being followed by this man, who had the right to defend himself. Defendant's interview, and you obviously know that he gave various interviews, and I want to just quickly highlight certain parts that I would submit to you are relevant as to establishing why this defendant is lying and why he was caught in numerous lies. And then obviously okay. why it happened. Wendy Dorval and uh, Sergeant Perks and Officer Buchanan and I'm the coordinator. And there's been a few um, times where I've seen a suspicious person in the neighborhood um, we call the police an non-emergency line, and these guys always get away. They okay. What made them suspicious? Any tape or recordings of vehicles that come in and out of that neighborhood? The last time they were down, the cameras it were It has broken. the ability, but... 
why, why did I put that thing about the camera there? Because as you recall, one of the ploys or tactics that was used by investigators for Rena was to say, hey, maybe the victim had a recorder or maybe somebody videotaped it out there. He, the defendant, knew that that, that didn't happen because he knew about it. He's the one that told the investigators, hey, contact uh, Mr. Taylor or Leland, whatever his name was. I'll give you his number. It's on my cell phone. So he knew that there wasn't any videotaping out there of this. It wasn't like, oh, he just, he took a gamble, you know, and he was really defending himself. And so he, you know, he said, hey, I'll volunteer. Go ahead and videotape it. Or I wish there was. No, he knew there wasn't any. So it wasn't like he was forthcoming with that information as like a truthful person. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and dispatch asked me where he went. I didn't know the name of the street that I was on. I... So you'd come off your street and go and do another street? Yes, ma'am. At some point, that okay. goes in, cuts through the middle of my neighborhood. Okay. I didn't know the name of the street um, or where he went. So I got out of my car to look for the street sign and to see if I could see where he cut through so I could tell the police. So after he circled your car, he disappeared again? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Two key points there. Didn't know the street name. It's only three streets, and he'll tell you. You'll see it, actually, from his own mouth when he's talking to the investigators out there. He names the street. But no, most importantly also, or just as important, is the fact that he's saying this man, Trayvon Martin, is circling his car. So he's in such dire strait or so fear that he gets out of the car to go follow him. So he's either truthful in saying he's circling the car or he's lying about it. Either way, it shows that he's not telling the truth because if he's really that in fear of why does he get out of the car or is he saying that as another explanation as to why maybe he had to kind of confront him as to explain that maybe, oh, it was the victim that attacked him. You see, the victim was already showing uh, that he was going to do something because he started circling the car. And that's what a person that's about to commit a crime does. That's what he wanted the police to believe. And find out where he went. And he said, we don't need you to do that. And I said, well, OK. Um, he said, we already have a police officer in route. And I said, oh, all right. And I, I had gone where, through the dog walk where I normally walk my dog and walked back through to my street, the street that loops around. And he said, we already have a police officer on the way. So I said, OK. I told, they said, would you like a police officer to meet you? And I said, yes. And I told him where my car was and the make and the model. Mm -hmm. So I was walking back through to where my car was and he jumped out from the bushes and he said what the fuck's your problem homie and I got my cell phone out to call 911 this mm -hmm. time and I said hey man I don't have a problem and he goes no now you have a problem and he punched me in the nose at that point I felt that okay so cute a few key things to remember there or point out that I would suggest to you number one is where he walks his dog but he doesn't know the name of the street terms of getting there's only again three streets number two is he's walking back even he's told not to follow him so he decides to obey even though he wasn't ordered not to follow him but he decides to go back to the car when this man came out of the bushes you will see that he changes that and he and he catches himself but you'll see it it's coming up because number one is to where those bushes were but he also at some point catches himself when he says I was going towards him. Oh, he, he came out. He came towards me. Didn't even see him getting ready to punch me. As soon as he punched me, I fell backwards um, into the grass. Okay. This man, Trayvon Martin, this teenager, came at him. Now, he's out there in the darkness, and he's got a gun, but of course, he hasn't taken his gun out because that would be illegal. He's got the right to conceal it because he suspects somebody of a crime. He's not a police officer. He can't go arrest him. But he's just kind of wandering out there in the darkness, even though this guy has circled his car. But he's not in fear. He's just kind of wandering. 
Does that make sense? He goes down to the darkness after somebody he's scared of, and he's not on guard to what's going on. See, because he's got to convince the police, and by virtue of giving that statement to the police, convince you, the defense has got to convince you, that he was just kind of walking and the victim came out of nowhere. Uh, improper presentation of the case law and the law concerning my client's obligations to prove anything. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, at the close of the um, end of the attorney's closing arguments, I will instruct you on the law that's applicable to this case, and you will be given that law back to uh, the jury room to compare with how you find the facts to be. Thank you. Go ahead. He's trying to convince the police that he hadn't done anything wrong on my nose and on my mouth and he says you're going to die tonight and again now he's saying that the level of violence towards him is escalating because Trayvon Martin just decides to shut him up by you know and, and the amazing thing and I'm going to get this to this in one of the uh, slides that you will see or PowerPoint presentations you'll see he must have had like 10 hands out there or 10 arms because he's able to do all this while the, the defendant is just sitting there, letting him put his hands over and not doing anything. Does that make sense? My jacket and my shirt came up. And when he said, you're going to die tonight, I felt his hand go down on my side. And I thought he was going for my firearm. So I grabbed it immediately. And as he banged my head again, I just pulled out my firearm and shot him. Okay. And then what happened? So, the gun wasn't exposed earlier. He's getting beat up, but he hasn't taken the gun out. It's only when the victim starts reaching for the gun. Now, he tells Osterman that he actually grabbed the gun or touched it. But he says he's reaching for the gun, and then I realize as he's holding my hand, one hand over my mouth, one hand over my nostril, I can't breathe, but I see it. He's got that, that third hand that he's going for the gun. Does that make sense? And the victim only went for the gun because the gun became ex exposed. Your Honor, with the court's uh, permission, I've had uh, the deputy check it, the gun, and I, I haven't checked it yet. Thank you, sir. He's got this gun and this holster. And you'll see in a few minutes, maybe more than a few minutes, one of the things that he does, he demonstrates to the police where he had the gun. And it wasn't right here in the front. It was towards the back, and it was hidden. And he'll demonstrate to the police out there where it was. Look at the gun. Look at the size of this gun. How did the victim see that in the darkness? Where was it? It wasn't outside. It was tucked in behind. And he'll demonstrate to the police where it was. How did the victim see this gun? Or is it just another lie that he tells? So I remember I once I shot him, I holstered my firearm and I got on top of him and I held his hands on because he was still talking. And he and uh, I said, stay down, don't move. And uh, then this a key point in that is that he tells the officers out there police station and later out at the scene that he didn't realize originally that he had shot the victim. Well, if he's in such fear and he's hasn't, he doesn't realize he shot him, what the heck is he doing holstering his gun? If he's so scared. 
Or is that just police jargon? That's what police do when they shoot somebody. First they make sure the person's either dead or handcuffed, and then they automatically holster the gun. But he's got that police jargon talking, and that's what the police are taught. But if he's so scared, what is he doing holstering his gun? Because he claims at one point that the victim said, oh, you got me or something, and he thought, oh, he scared him. Because he's trying to convince the police that he really didn't intend to shoot him at that point. That, yeah, he was in fear, but he really wasn't intending to shoot him. He was just trying to kind of scare him, maybe. Recall, it's always dark. They always come around nighttime. And... They always come around at nighttime. They being, pardon my language, the assholes or the fucking punks that are committing these burglaries. Again, going back to that assumption that he made originally when he profiled a 17-year-old boy that had Skittles. That's the crime he committed that evening. Skittles that he didn't even steal from 7-Eleven. He legitimately bought. You saw the videotape. He wasn't instilling fear into that clerk over there because he was wearing a hoodie. But somehow, this man right here became suspicious of a 17-year-old kid who's wearing a hoodie at 70 in the evening or 7:10 in the evening. straight through to see if there was a street sign that I could tell dispatch where I lost sight of him at. And when I walked back, that's when he came out of the darkness, and I guess he was upset that I called the police. Now he's starting to speculate or trying to convince the police, oh, I guess that's why he must have attacked me or why he came out, because he must have been upset that I called the police. See, he's trying to justify to the police why he did what he did. And of course, it's not that he came to the wrong assumption originally. It's no, I was just checking for the street sign. I was just doing my job as a neighborhood watchman or just a citizen concerned about crime. And I guess he came out of there because he must have realized that I called the police, meaning that first assumption still existing in his mind. He is a criminal, and that's what criminals do. They don't want to get caught. cell phone away okay. and then when I walked back towards him I I saw him coming at me did you hear that when I walked back towards him he switches mid-sentence I saw him coming towards me he acknowledges at that point that he is the aggressor he's the one that's going and pursuing the victim but he catches himself when he says that and then he goes oh he walked towards me I went to throw my phone. I don't remember if I had time to pull it out or not. And he claims that he went to for the phone. See, because he's got to then explain why he, being a 5'7", 204 pound, perfectly healthy 28 year old man, is overpowered by this 5'11", 158 pound kid. And he, being the one that's tracking him or following him, He's on guard. He's got two flashlights. He's got a gun. This kid is the one that's scared because this guy's following him. He's got to explain why this kid got the upper hand. Oh, I, I was going for my phone, and I just got distracted. Was he going for his phone, or was he going for a gun? Were they in the same place? Defendant's interview, that same day, part two. What did he do there? He drew uh, different areas and it tracks in terms of where he was, where he claims he saw the victim, where the victim just came out of nowhere, where the victim was just kind of looking suspicious. And you know, you've got that in evidence. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with that, but he drew the different places where he claims the victim was and what, in his mind, caused him to be suspicious of a 17-year-old boy. 
defendants, photo or photographs taken of the defendant that you saw. Defense made a big deal. Oh, he was washed up. Well, you've got this bloody photograph here, and you've got that, I guess, and according to Dr. DeMayo, I guess one of the uh, EMS people out there just kind of put it back in place, put the nose back in place because you heard from Ms. Falgate. She didn't see anything. She saw it might be fractured. They don't know. What she recommended is go get x-rays. That's how we verify it. Defendant refused or declined to do that. That's his privilege. But they're going to argue to you, oh, he had a broken nose. Well, first of all, who was following who? Who started the, the fight or struggle? I circled this because in reviewing the evidence, I thought this might be interesting to you. And what I'm cir circled up there are his shoes. The defense claims the defendant told the police that he was on his back the whole time and the victim was just wailing on him. Well, and you can look at the actual photograph. There's actually some glass on top and it appears wet, as if maybe he at some point was on top of the victim. Just a minor point. Kind of corroborates some of the evidence, the witness's testimony. Says Exhibit 52, the back jacket of the defendant. Wow. Where's all the scrapes, scratch marks? Something to reflect all this tension with this concrete that occurred out there. How come it's missing? Back of his head. You recall the testimony? There was two. How small were they? You recall the testimony of, of the witness, Ms. Folgate? I think I had her. Tell me how, how, how big it was. And I think she was, I mean, it was hard to keep. Anyway, do you remember it? Why are his hands not injured? If this 17-year-old young man is wailing on him, how come he's not defending himself? Again, these are just little parts of the interview that he gave, and you, you obviously heard this, so I just want to take you, you to take a second to read that. But he talks about these guys. He talks about not knowing any places. Again, he's trying to make up one lie after another after another. Yeah, he was serving in my car. As soon as I saw him coming, I rolled up the window because I was so scared of him. Because he was a criminal. I didn't know the name of the street that I was on. And then he talks about, you know, they remind him, we didn't need you to do that. I had already gone through the dog walk, told him where my car was, make a model, jumped out of the bushes, hey man, you have a problem, and then punched me and fell to the ground. And then he's wailing on my head. And I yelled for help. He grabbed my head and hit it into the sidewalk. When he started doing that, I slid into the grass, still yelling for help. Help, he's killing me. And then, of course, this criminal put his hands over my mouth and said, you're going to die tonight. And that's what, of course, led me to the gun. He's got that legal training he's aware of in terms of what he's got to say. <clears throat> he, the victim, said, you got me after being shot. And he was still talking. I said, stay down, don't move. I got on top of him. He said, ow, ow. And then he, he talking about that he's telling the people that came out, I don't need you to call the police. I need you to help me with this guy. But he holsters his gun too at the same time. It's always dark. You know, they always come out <laughs> around nighttime. Then he talks about still not having seen the victim. He was struck in the nose. I screamed help probably 50 times. Anything else important? No. You didn't try to make contact with him? No. Then, you know, you can see the map. You can track down when you look at, at the timeline in terms of does it match where he's claiming he's at when he's talking. I would submit to you it doesn't. But again, you rely on what the evidence shows. Came out of the bushes. I don't recall if he came from the front or behind. 
He punched me in the face and I fell backwards. When I, back, when I walked back towards him, I saw him coming at me. He catches himself at mid-sentence. That is the truth. When I walked back toward him, meaning I was going towards where he was, and he goes, oh, and he was coming at me. In that written statement he gave to the police, my purpose in showing you this is he, start, he now refers to the suspect. Not, pardon my language, effing punk or asshole. Now he's the police term for a criminal that they haven't arrested a suspect. He's got that down pat. Suspect over and over. Trying to impress the police like he knows the stuff. Hey, you know, I wanted to be a police officer one day. Suspect this, suspect that, suspect that. Fired one shot into his torso. You know, he's got all the language down. To Detective Investigator Serino, followed, lost side, had flashlight, but it was dead. You got a problem? No, you've got a problem now. And all of a sudden, he beat him, started beating him, smothered by mouse and nose. Felt him slide his hand down. You're going to die tonight, MF. You got me. I spread hand, his hands away from the body, still talking, but I don't remember what he said. Let's talk about. There's been a history of uh, break ins in that building, and I called previously about this house. Right. When the police arrived at this house, when I called the first time, the windows were open and the door was unlocked. Uh, and the police came and secured it. So I said, you know what? I, it's better to just call and okay. I kept driving. I passed him and he was he kept staring at me and staring around, looking around uh -huh. to see who else was I don't know why he was looking at me. Did he walk off from there or did he stop there last night? He stopped and he he, he like looked around and that's why I was, This is what he claims this criminal is doing. Where was he standing at when you Boy, that's a crime at RTL on Sunday night, February 26. Standing out there in the grass. Okay, and I went to the clubhouse. All right. Up here on the inside. Line, mm -hmm. And when I got through, I parked at the clubhouse. Right. And they asked me, you know, where I was, and I told them the clubhouse, and I think I gave them the address of the clubhouse. Where'd you park it? Right up here next to that green truck. I don't know if that truck was there, but I just pulled up. Okay. In there. So you just pulled in here? Yes, sir. And this is where you got out? No. Um, this is where I was stopped to call, to call them. Then he walked past me, and he kept looking at my car, and uh, still looking around at the houses and stuff. So uh, then the uh, dispatcher said, uh, where did he go? What direction did he go? And I said, I don't know. I lost, because he cut down here and made a right. I guess it's Twin Trees Lane. Did you catch that? Did you catch him in one lie right there? He originally told the police over and over, before and even after this interview, he didn't know the name of the street. And then when they just kind of let him talk, he gives the name right there. I mean, it's common sense. There's only three streets, and he's lived there four years. Again, why did he have to lie about that? Because he does not want to admit that he was following this innocent young boy. The 17 year old. He made a right in there, and they said, well, what direction did he go? And I said, I don't know, I can't see him. And they said, can you get to somewhere where you can see him? And I said, yeah, I, I can. So I backed out. Right about where that sign is in the yard. 
in front of the Ford truck? Yes, and I saw him. And I saw him walking back that way and then cut through the back of the houses. He looked back and he noticed me and he cut back through the houses. I was still on the phone with non-emergency. Mm -hmm. um, and then he came back and he started walking up towards the grass and then came down and circled my car. And I told the operator that he was circling my car. I didn't hear if he said anything, right. but he had his hand in his waistband. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I told the operator that. And they said, where are you? And I could not remember the name of the street because I don't live on this street. Right. Retreat U Circle goes in a circle. Oh, right. And I said, I, I, I don't know. And he goes, we need an address. And I said, I don't know an address. I think I gave them my address. What, two minutes earlier, a minute earlier, he'd given him the street name, but now he's telling <coughs> this investigator that that's the reason why he had to go and follow. I'm sorry, not follow. He had to go find the address because he wants to justify as to why he would go down that route. Just by coincidence, it keeps kind of tracking where this criminal is going. Out and look for a street sign. Right. So I got out of my car and I started walking. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> street sign here, but I knew if I went straight through that that's Retreat View Circle, and I could give him an address. Give me the address of the house here in front of me. And there's no address because this is the back of the house. Did, did you catch him there? Did you see that? There's an there's a address right there to the right, but of course, he directs the attention to the investigators. See, this is the back of the houses. There's no address there. Like, they're just fools. I didn't see him at all. He was walking. Watch that he's dead though. And I looked around and I didn't see anybody. And I told non-emergency, I said, you know what, he's gone. He's not even here. Right. So I still thought I could use their address, so I walked all the way through. actually walked all the way to the street and I was going to give them this address and they said well if he's not there do you still want a police officer and I said yes and they said do you still want a police officer and I said yes and they said are you following him oh I'm sorry back there they said are you following him and I said yes because I was you know in the area and they said well, He's only following him because he happens to be in the area. We don't need you to do that. And I said, okay. So I, that's when I walked straight through here to get the address so that I could meet the police officer. And then they said, uh, I said, he's not here. They said, do you still want him to come? And I said, yes. And they said, I passed here. I looked. I didn't see anything again. And I was walking back to my truck. And then when I got to right about here, he yelled from behind me to the side of me. He said, yo, you got a problem? And I turned around and I said, no, I don't have a problem, man. Where was, he, where was he at? He was about there, but he was walking towards me. Yes, sir. I believe, like I said, I was already past that, so I didn't see exactly where he came from, but he was about where you were. And I said, no, I don't have a problem. And I went to go grab my cell phone, but my, I left it in a different pocket. I went, I looked down in my pant pocket, and he said, you got a problem now. And then he was here, and he punched me in the face. Right here? Right this spot? Up around here. Okay. To be honest with you, I don't remember exactly. Um, I, I stumbled, and I, I fell down, and he pushed me down. Somehow he got on top of me. 
on the grass or it was like? It was over, more over here. I think I was trying to push him away from me and then he got on top of me somewhere around here. And I started screaming for help. I started screaming, help, help, as loud as I could. Notice what's right here. One of those uh, sprinkler boxes thing. Could that have caused some of the injury? And... That's when I started screaming for help. I started screaming, help, help, as loud as I could. And... Um, see where he's pointing to? Did you see where he's grabbing? Where he's got his firearm? My jacket moved up and he saw it. I feel like he saw it. He looked at it and he said, you're going to die tonight, motherfucker. And he reached for it. But he reached for it. Like I felt his arm going down to my side and I grabbed it and I just grabbed my firearm and just shot him. One of his other versions is that he actually grabbed the victim's arm and removed the arm so he would have a better shot. Again, he's able to do all this. I guess the victim has two or three hands or arms. See if that all makes sense, what he's describing. I said, don't flip him over. I don't know how I got on top of him. I'm sorry. That's fine. But I got on his back and I moved his arms apart because when he was repeatedly hitting me in the face and the, the head, I thought he had something in his hands. And so I just, I, I moved his hands apart. Again, you saw the photograph taken by Mr. Manalo. Again, lying about that. Because he's trying to justify to the police that he was searching because, of course, the victim had to have something in his hand, meaning some kind of weapon that would have caused him to resort to the shooting him. Shot him, he like sat up. So you're standing here, you're still in this position here, basically. Yes, sir. Down here, I shot him, so he's in the breast. Yes, sir, he was on top of me like this. I shot him. And I didn't think I hit him, because he sat up. And he said, oh, you got me. You got it, you got me, you got it, something like that. So I thought he was just saying, I know you have a gun now, I heard it, I'm giving up. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I pushed him off me or he fell off me, either way. First he says he assumed he hadn't shot him, but then he had to push him off of him. Does that make sense? I guess when he said you, you got, he just kind of fell into him when he hasn't been shot. And again, this is just in written form, some of the stuff you've already heard just to kind of remind you of some important stuff. You've also got it, I'm not gonna play it for you, but you got a car clubhouse video, it's very short. There's um, clips of it. By coincidence, it appears that there's a vehicle going in it. You might even see a person, not that you see a full figure, that's just impressions or shadows, but you definitely see a car around the area where, where the mailboxes are. By coincidence, what Rachel Gentel told you all in terms of where the victim was describing he was, he was. Under that shaded part when it was raining, he was in the mailbox where he described a defendant looking at him. He kept yelling. That is, he claims the victim kept yelling. Of course, nobody else heard this, but told the police it happened. Did Mr. Good say anything about when he came out that he heard the victim say or the person on top say, pardon my language, you're going to die tonight, motherfucker? And look where he's reenacting it when you watch the video. Defendant's interview on the 29th. Just wait until he's in Oh, 
Did you position yourself strategically or anything? No, I was just trying to hear what he was saying. Oh. He seemed nervous. Uh oh. <laughs> I didn't think he was like gonna beat you up or nothing, don't you mean? I yeah. thought you were because yeah. the four of you kind of got in between. Yeah, that's it. Natural. Oh. Do it so many times that way. <laughs> Just a minor, minor point. What was the relevance of that? Why did I think it was important for you to hear again? Because he, in terms of wanting to be a police officer, he wants to know what she was doing to safeguard the firearm when somebody's around. Again, he's trying to talk that police jargon. He's also trying to be impressive, impress these police officers. Like, yeah, I'm one of you all. You know, I, I can understand police officers and all that stuff. I've got a criminal justice stuff. You know, you know how it is. You just kind of come into contact with people and. You know, sometimes somebody attacked you and all that, trying to befriend them. But he's talking that police jargon. He's curious as to how you do that. The other thing that's important, and you've seen it by the photographs and also by the uh, videos that you've seen, you saw how he was. Because I think Mr. Pollock said, oh, he was this overweight person and all that. Okay, he's a little overweight. Technically, he's two, 204, I believe, 5'7". But he's, he's pretty fit there when you see him walking around. Because you might contrast that in terms of, you know, if you see him now in terms of his big, he, he was pretty fit then. So compare how he appeared then, and most importantly, compare how Trayvon Martin appeared, the ME photographs. Are you gonna go ahead and actually ask this person what he was doing out there? No, sir. Very basic question. You didn't bother to ask. I mean, this guy was suspicious what he's doing, circling the car. You didn't even ask him what he's doing? No, sir. He's a criminal. You don't have to ask criminals what you know what they're doing. At this point, you've had two opportunities to identify yourself as somebody who was actually not meant to do them harm. Problem being is that both his and his mind's eye, which I can't get into because he's passed, that he perceives you as a threat. Okay? He perceives you as a threat. He has every right to go and defend himself, especially when he reaches into your pocket to grab the cell phone. Okay. Very insightful question by Investigator Serena. Like, you're reaching for your pocket and it'd be, you know, like, gun? Nine. Ever say to him, I'm never going to go No. Did it not occur to you? I, no, I always said, I don't have a problem, and I started backing away from it. But you kind of did have a problem. That's why you were following him, right? You had a concern with him. I was scared. You were scared to tell him that you had a concern? And that you were able to watch? You were afraid to tell him that? Uh, yes, ma'am. I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Again, now when they're pressing him on that issue, oh, he's backing away, inconsistent with what he said earlier, then he's scared of him. He's scared of this person that he's following all over in the darkness out there, but of course he doesn't have his gun out nor does he feel a need to because, but he's scared of them. Can't have it both ways. I'm secure, I'm secure, basically. Okay. No locking mechanism, no safety feature, nothing. Mm -hmm. It was inside your pants? Yes, sir. Okay. Mine over inside your pants. He was mounted on you. You were able to, he, he was mounted on your upper chest? Or, I mean, at what point were you able to free your waist side to go ahead and pull out your weapon? When he, he was mounted on me, but he had, following him or chasing him or profiling him. Just it, man. 
these assholes. What's behind that? People that victimized the nation. They ask him, what do you mean by on my land these assholes? People who victimized the neighborhood. You don't know why? I don't know why I'm yelling I don't know. This is what he tells Investigator Serena. It doesn't sound like my voice. Essentially yells. Again, we've covered this already, but I just wanted you to be able to read it too. Talking about the video camera. Oh yeah, I wish it was there. He knowing all along that he knew the video cameras depends on whether they were working or not. And then when they ask him, how do you not know the street name? There's only three. Oh, I've got a bad memory. Always asking an excuse. Or he just they catch him in a lie and then he explains it away or tries to. Then, it, then when they confront him, okay, hold on, this guy's getting right next to you. And oh, well, he didn't really circle the entire car. And he tries to explain why this individual, Trayvon Martin, is suspicious to him. And he's determined to get that address. It's not to go follow the guy. It's not to go follow the victim. It's to just get the address. Again, is it he just wants to catch the bad guy? The guy, the effing punk that gets away? Is that why he's saying that? Then we move on to July 20th. 2013, Mr. Hannity, he's giving him home runs, easy questions. Can't even get that right, because he tells one lie after another. Listen. And then we get to the issue where you said to, on the, on the 911 call, that he's running. You said that to the, the dispatch. Is there any chance in retrospect, as you look back on that night and what happened? Yes, sir trying to maybe get into the mindset, because we also have learned that, that Trayvon was speaking with his girlfriend, supposedly, at the time, that maybe he was afraid of you, didn't know who you were? No. You don't think that, why do you think that he was running then? Um, well, I, I mean, maybe I said running, but he was more... You said he was running. Yes. Uh, it was like skipping, going away quickly, mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't running out of fear. You can tell the difference. He wasn't running. He wasn't, he wasn't actually running. You know, sir? Okay. Hannity just asked him a very simple question. Well, perhaps Trayvon Martin was scared of you since you're following him and he's running away from you. And so he realizes at that time, the defendant realizes, oh, that doesn't look good because that means I'm chasing him. That means Trayvon Martin is the one that's scared. That doesn't look good for me. So what does he say? Oh, he's skipping away. La, la, la. That's what he's claiming. The unbuckling of the seatbelt. Here you open the car door. Uh, and uh, this dispatch asks you at that point, and this became a, a very key moment that everyone in the media focused on. And the dispatcher asked you, are you following him? And you said yes. Explain that. I meant that I was going in the same direction as him uh, to keep an eye on him so that I could tell the police where he was going. I didn't mean that I was actually pursuing him. I'm not following my daughter when she's out in the street and I'm scared something's going to happen. I'm just kind of going in the same direction that she's in. I felt him take, uh, he, he had, uh, after he couldn't uh, hit my head on the concrete anymore, um, he started to try to suffocate me. Um, and I continued to take, push his hands off of my mouth and my nose, particularly because it was excruciating, having a broken nose and 
and putting his weight on it. Uh, and that's the point in time when he started telling me to shut up, shut up, shut up. Uh, and Why I didn't tell you to shut up? I don't know. Where's all that blood on Trayvon Martin's hands? So is he screaming or not? Because why would, allegedly, Trayvon Martin tell him to shut up if he's not screaming? When did he first see your gun? After we were on the ground, I shimmied uh, with him on top of me, and it made my jacket rise up. And he being on top of me, uh, saw it on my right side. Gotta explain how this dark gun is concealed, which is concealed in his backside there, how all of a sudden it just became exposed. To get to the grass, yes sir. And how did you do that? I, uh, I guess you could say shimmy. I mean, he was straddled on me uh, with his full weight and I would. At that point he's able to just kind of shimmy. Before he's, he's incapable of fighting back as he claims the victim is bashing his head over and over, but at this point he gets, I guess, some strength and kind of shimmies. And then, what does he say? I feel that it was all God's plan, and for me to second guess it or judge it, um, is there anything you might do differently? In retrospect, the time has passed a little bit. No, sir. You know, about that it speaks for itself and again you just heard it so I'll just put it up there just other parts of the same interview Mr. Osterman, his best friend, who wrote a book about this experience, about the defendant. As the victim had a slender bill, the victim saw the defendant using the phone, followed him in his car first, then he got out and didn't know the name of the street, tried to establish visual contact within arm's reach, etc. Straddle means knees on the armpit and punching. I guess I might as well do what everybody else, a lot of the lawyers have done, is using whatever we're going to call this. But you see what he is saying now? He's saying that armpits, how does he get the gun out? Armpits, how does he get the gun out? Truth does not lie. Early, earlier, he showed you, he showed the police where that gun was. So how does he manage to get out and get a perfect shot to the heart of a 17-year-old man? Teenager. He doesn't say he grabbed the holster, he grabbed the gun between the rear sight and the hammer. Now these are two individuals, that is Mr. Osterman, who is a trained federal agent, and, a, and who's trained the defendant in terms of firearms, so they know what they're talking about. In fact, he suggested the perfect gun to get. He describes in detail what part of the gun the victim touched. No DNA, only the defendant's DNA. I guess that got washed away too. Or is it another lie that he tells? Pivot at 90 degrees, etc. Thought he might try to get up again. At some point he goes, I, didn't, I wasn't sure whether he's dead, but then he holsters the gun. 
All right, let's talk about ill will in terms of one of the elements in terms of murder. And I'm going through this real quickly. Spent years in trying in college trying to be a police officer. Dreams of hunting fugitives. Those are some of the documents that were submitted that I don't know if you had an opportunity to, to read or review. Learns all about self-defense law, exactly what you have to say. Talking about here in terms of the fact that the stucco man has actually been involved in catching somebody, so he wants to get credit for it too. He doesn't want to be left out after all. He's the neighborhood coordinator. Of course, he wants to make Trayvon Martin a criminal. And he couldn't find the address. Recall? How he's trying to mislead the police. Oh, see, there's no address in the back of these. Why? If he's not doing anything wrong in following an individual, why does he have to lie about it? Common sense. How many arms did Trayvon Martin need for punching, moving to the sidewalk, grabbing the head, smothering the mouth and nose, grabbing for the gun all at the same time? How many arms did he need? How much supposed activity can be packed into 70 seconds? That's what we're talking about. Assuming it, be, it began immediately after the Rachel uh, Trayvon phone call. Moves, what, 40 plus feet from where he claims it started? Man, somebody there's the flash. What he claims Trayvon Martin did to him, 25 plus punches, 25 slams. How's he alive? How is the defendant alive? Or is he exaggerating that to justify in his mind what he had to do? The wrist lock that he describes. How did he learn that technique? Perhaps it was at the mixed martial arts that he kind of went three days a week or two days a week, three hours, but he really didn't get much training. Think about the time frame here. So the evidence agree in terms of the physical evidence and the testimony. I will submit it does. In terms of the guilt of this defendant. You recall Mr. O'Brien, the HOA president there at RTL, what he talked about in terms of the procedures they're supposed to follow in terms of neighborhood watch, et cetera. You recall Ms. Dorville about, you don't know, follow people, call the police. Second degree murder. State's got to prove three elements. The victim, unfortunately, is dead. The death was caused by the criminal act of this defendant. And if there was an unlawful killing of Trayvon Martin by the act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and perform pursuant to a single design or purpose. I am not going to let this effing punk or these A's get away. He's a criminal. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act of series of acts that a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily harm. I am following this guy, I'm armed, and I'm going to make sure he doesn't get away before the police get here. It's done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent. The defense is going to claim, oh, he didn't have any, he was just a little upset. Why is he having to utter those things? Why is he having to lie about the whole thing? If he wasn't doing anything wrong in following this victim, why does he have to lie about it? Why won't he admit that he went to follow him? Why does he have to come up with this, I didn't know the street, I didn't know the address? Doesn't that kind of show his mental state? It's of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. And in order to convict a second degree murder, it's not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent. It's not first degree murder. We're not saying that he intended to go and kill him. Read this for a moment there. They speak volumes of his choices.
Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Victor really didn't get to choose anything, did he? Or anyone. State is, uh, the instructions that the court will read to you will tell you in part that uh, the state has charged this defendant with second degree murder. If you return a verdict, verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense, which has been proven, and there's a lesser included. And Hurricane Katrina wasn't just a thunder shower. In other words, your duty is if you find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the highest crime, then if not, then you go to a lesser crime. Manslaughter, he committed an intentional act which resulted in the death, he used a deadly weapon, excusable or uh, justifiable. You'll get those instructions too about no accident, misfortune, et cetera. And the court's gonna read the whole instruction to you. I just was. In terms of how you decide, and we talked briefly about that, it's to the evidence introduced into it alone. Case must be decided only upon the evidence and the instructions. What the lawyers say is not evidence and you are not even to consider it as such. May not decide because you're biased or sympathy or angry at anyone or feel sorry for anyone. Why do we have such rules? What if, that's not a lack of evidence, there could always be more, that's not reasonable. You will not hear because a lawyer or a Hollywood screenwriter can imagine something more than could be done, you must find the evidence lacking. You know, we don't have a big animation of how it happened. Is, did anybody see it out there? The defendant told the police this is what happened. There were no eyewitnesses of the actual shooting. Doubt? And again, what's, what's not reasonable? Self-defense. This is what the defendant applied to Virginia. I'm down fugitives, and you'll see the, the letters, emails, etc. Isn't that true? Again, the key point is that injuries really are not required if a person is legitimately in fear for their life. But why exaggerate them? Unless he's lying about the whole thing. Yeah, no DNA. Fingerprints also weren't on the gun. Blood wasn't there. Credibility. But should you believe the defendant? Think about this. What a coincidence. That makes sense. Think of the jacket as he's claiming is going, he's going down an angle. Which way would it go? Would the gun be exposed or just the opposite? Think about this.
Doesn't that speak the truth? What a coincidence. The shot, all of a sudden the yelling stops. You see where some of those injuries are? What, did they pick up a sidewalk or did he turn them upside down? Or is it just by scraping and rolling and fighting out there? They both were. I'm wrapping this up, believe it or not, and I thank you for your time and your patience. I ask you to come back with a verdict that speaks the truth, a verdict that is just. You heard from many people in this case, and I've summarized some of them. There's a lot more, actually, that you heard. We know you paid close attention throughout all these proceedings. Some of the people you heard from were the parents of both the victim and the defendant. Unfortunately, the only photographs left of Trayvon Martin are those ME photographs. I mean, they've still got other photographs, and you saw some of them, the football, when he was younger days, but they can't take any more photos. And that's true because of the actions of one person. The man before you, the defendant, George Zimmerman. The man who is guilty of second degree murder. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to recess for the evening. Before I let you go, and while you're getting your notepads uh, to be ready to put place face down, I'm going to give you my instructions. You're not to discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anybody else. You're not to read or listen to any emails, text messages, um, or social networking pages about the case. You're not to create or read any of those. You're not to get on the internet to do any independent research about the case, people, places, things, or events. And you're not to read or listen to any newspaper, radio, or television reports. Do I have your assurances that you will abide by these instructions? We will be in recess until 9 a.m. Please put your notepads face down and follow Deputy Jarvis back into the jury room. Actually, it'll be 8.30. 8.30. Please be seated. Council, you've got the final draft of the jury instructions in the verdict form. Um, if you'll let me know in the morning if there's any issues with them. I might point out just uh, there, Mr. Zimmerman's name is misspelled on the verdict form. On the verdict form? Yes. It, his name is spelled on the verdict form Z L. M -M -E -R -M -A -M. No. The one I have, it has Z I M M. Like it's 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 the same as it is on the jury instructions. Well, mine isn't. I thought I had the right one. It's it's not the it's the first sentence, not the not style. The style. Oh, I see. I thought you said the style. No, yes, no, if no. you'll correct that on the first sentence, yeah, first, second, round. and third, all of them. Yeah, all of them. You put, a, you put a capital I instead of a small I in all those. So the second page seems to be fine. It's the first page. And if you'll let me know if there are any other concerns or issues regarding the jury instructions. If there anything else that we need to take up before we recess for the evening. You're going to bring that, those other items in the morning. Thank you. Nothing. Anything from the state? No, I'll call guys. That's okay. Thank you. Good night. Uh, court is in recess until 8.30. Have, have you resolved Defense Exhibit 39? Mr. Dela? Yes, yes. Okay, so 39 is...
It'll be accepted by the court. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.